Hey guys, welcome to another Python tutorial for beginners. So in our previous video, we learned about for loops and few different operations that we can do with for loops. So in today's video, we'll take a look at few examples of how we can apply what we learned by going through few examples together. So let's get started. So the first example that we'll take a look at is to write a function that checks whether a given number is a prime number. So then let's first start with what prime number is. So prime number is the positive integer greater than 1 that does not have any factors other than 1 and then the number itself. So for example, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, and so on are considered as a prime number because these numbers that are listed here is not divisible by anything other than the 1 and then the number itself. But if we take a look at the non-prime number like 12, 12 can be divisible by any other factors other than 1 and 12. So 12 is divisible by 2, 3, 4, 6, and so on. So in this case, 12 is not a prime number because it has more factors that we listed here other than 1 and then the number itself. So what we're going to do in this example is to write a function that takes a user input so that you can enter a number to check whether the number is a prime number or not. And later on, we'll try to make a slight modification into that prime number function so that it can check the range of numbers instead of a single number. And this prime number question is a very common and basic question for any sort of tech interviews. So it'll be good for us to fully understand the concepts here. So let me first create a function here. So I can create a function and name it as get user input and then colon and inside here I'm gonna get the user input so user input equal to and since we're gonna take the integer value I'm gonna wrap the input function with the integer and then input and put your message here so I can say enter on integer colon space here and then this function will just return the user input return user input so as you guys may have seen in previous videos, this function is just getting an integer value from end users, in this case me, so that we can actually call this get user input function within our prime number function. And now let's create another function to check the prime number. So I can do def check prime number. And then the first step here is to call the user input. So I can do user input equal to get user input, the function that we created. And then the second step is to check whether the user input is greater than one. And the reason why we want to check that is because by default, uh, number 0 and 1 are not prime numbers. So we want to say if user input is greater than 1 colon. And below the if statement, let's define our for loop. So we can do for i in range, then start from 2 and stop at the user input. And the reason why we start at the 2 is because uh, integer 1 is divisible by any numbers anyway. So we want to actually start from index of 2. And then we want to stop right before the user input. So if the user input was 5, then we want to actually stop at 4. So in this case, let me just print out this. So print user input, comma i. And let me just call this function just to test it out. So I can do check prime number below and then execute it. And then if I just run this, then you will see a prompt, enter an integer. I can put 5 here. And then what you will see is the, in the first iteration, you will see the user input as 5, and then the i will be 2 because we are starting from 2, and then the second iteration is going to increment by 1, 3, and 4, and so on, and it's going to stop at 4 because user input is exclusive. So now we have our user input and index generated from this for loop ready. Let's try to use these two numbers to check whether a given number is a prime number. So as you see in the screen, in order for you to check whether the number is a prime number, the number should only be divisible by 1 and then the number itself. In other words, when you divide this user input, meaning 5 by 2, the remainder should not be 0 because if you get the remainder of 0, that means that it was actually divisible by numbers that we are iterating through, meaning the indexes that we are generating here. So if you divide 5 by 1, the remainder is 0, and this means that 5 was actually divisible by 1. But if you look at 5 divided by 2, 3, and 4, the remainder is not 0, meaning that 5 is not divisible by 2, 3, and 4. And when you divide 5 by 5, you also get the remainder of 0. So in this case, we can say that 5 is a prime number because 5 is only divisible by 1 and then the number itself. Then now, let's take a look at the example of 4 here. So integer 4 is divisible by 1, just like 5, but it is also divisible by 2 because when you divide 4 by 2, you get the remainder of 0. And at the end, 4 is also divisible by the number itself, which is 4. So 4 
4 is not a prime number because it was divisible by anything other than 1 or the number itself. In this case, the integer of 2. So the idea here is that in this for loop, we are generating a number always starting from 2 because all numbers are divisible by 1 anyway. And we are stopping before the number itself because the stop index is exclusive. And this is intentional because we already know that all numbers are divisible by itself anyway. So there is no point of us including the number itself here. So what this means is that if the user input number is divisible by any of the number that we generate from this for loop, meaning if the remainder is zero, that means that the user input is not a prime number, otherwise it is a prime number. So as we learned in the operator video, if you want to check the remainder from a division, you can use the modular operator, which is the percent sign. So in here, I can write an if statement here saying if user input percent i equal equal zero, then I want to return first because it is not a prime number because it was actually divisible by some number here. So this user input percent i basically returns the remainder of the division from the user input by the i. And if the remainder is equal to zero, I want to return first uh, because this means that the user input has another divisible other than one and then the number itself. And one thing to notice here is that when the condition is mad, meaning that when we actually go inside this if block, I'm actually returning something. So I'm returning first saying that the number, the user input is not a prime number. So when you actually return something in the function, as we learned, everything in the function gets terminated, meaning all the logic that you have or the iteration that's going on will be terminated instantly and the output of the function will just return first right away. So then with that in mind, let me also put the else block followed by the for loop that we have. So I can put else here and in here I'm just going to return true, return true and just delete this print statement for now. So as we learned, when else block is followed by the for loop without the if statement, that means that whatever that's inside the else block will be executed after the iteration is over in the for loop. So in this case, if any of the number, the index that we generate within the for loop is actually divisible by the user input, then we instantly return first. Otherwise, the for loop keeps going on and when the iteration is over, it's going to come to the else block and it's going to return true. Uh, so what this means is that the entire iteration could not find any case where user input remainder is zero. So that that's why it came to the else block and it is returning true because we couldn't find any case where the user input is actually equal to zero. So basically if the interpreter comes to this else block, that means that we found the prime number. And let me also try to finalize this if statement by having an else right here at the same line as if else and I'm going to return first here. And the reason why I return first is because the if statement says that if the user input is greater than one, so the else block is basically meaning either zero or one will come to the else block and zero and one by default are not prime numbers. So that's why I'm just returning the first here. Okay, so now we have all our logic implemented. Let me try to run this by uh, wrapping this function call inside the print statement because we don't have any print statement inside the function. So we want to see the result. And if I run this one more time, then you will see a prompt enter an integer. So if I put five, then it's going to return true, meaning five is a prime number. And if I try to run this again and try to put four here, then it's going to say first, meaning four is not a prime number because four is also divisible by two. Then this time, let me try a bigger number here. So let me run this again. And in the prompt, I can put 317 and you will see true, meaning 317 is a prime number because it is not divisible by anything other than one and then the number itself. So if I try to run this one more time, and this time if I put 318 here, then it's going to return first. And this means that our function actually found another divisible other than the one and then the number itself. Okay, so we just implemented a small algorithm that checks whether a given number is a prime number or not. Then let's try to utilize what we already implemented to create a function that checks the prime number in the range of numbers. So let me create a function here. So I can do that, get range prime number. And in here, the first step is the same. So get the user input and then call the function, get user input. And in below, I'm going to create an outer for loop. So I'm going to say for index in range and then user input plus one colon. So I'm having an outer for loop here, which will iterate through the range of numbers that we are providing as the stop index, user input plus one. And the reason why I do plus one here is because stop index is exclusive, but I want to generate all numbers, including the numbers that we provide to this function, meaning the user input. So that's why I'm doing the user input plus one. 
And from here, let me try to copy and paste the algorithm that we have inside this for loop here. So I can just go up here and then just paste the entire thing from the if and else statement and then come down here and then pass it below the for loop. Okay, so now all we have to do is just to modify a couple of the variables here. Since we have the outer loop that generated index, instead of having the user input here, we want to actually check the numbers, meaning the index, whether the index is actually greater than one. So I'm just gonna copy and paste the index here and replace with the user input. And same thing for all other things. So in the second for loop, we are actually looping through not the user input, but the index because the user input is already being iterated through by the outer for loop. So just copy and paste again and replace here. And in here, I want to also check whether the index is actually the remainder is zero rather than the user input. So just paste it here again. And instead of having the return statement here, let me have a print statement because we have the auto for loop here. So what we can do here is that just print out print not prime. And in here, we can just say print prime. Actually, let me make that capitalize prime. And let me also copy and paste the print statement one more time. And then just print here. And let's also try to print that number out. So I can just pass the index here and pass the index here as well as well as pass the index here and one last thing that we have to do here is that we have to actually put the break statement inside this if block meaning the inside is a nested for loop that we have because uh, previously we are actually returning something and when you return something you actually instantly terminate everything that's going on inside this function but uh, this time we are actually using the print statement instead of return statement so in this case we have to actually have a method to manually say that if you found an index meaning a number that is not a prime number that we want to instantly break out from this nested for loop and then move to the next iteration for the outer for loop. So for that, inside this if statement, let me just put the break statement here. And I think that's about it. So we can just call this function. So I can do a uh, get range prime number uh, parenthesis. And if I just run this, then you will see a prompt entering integer. So if I put five here, then you will be able to see all the numbers starting from zero to five saying whether the zero is a prime or not. So zero is not prime, one is not prime, two is prime, three is prime, four is not prime, and five is prime. So we can actually see all the numbers starting from zero to five, which is the number that we provided, and whether each number is a prime number or not. So let me try to run this one more time with a bigger number, and I can put 57 here. Then it's gonna actually generate starting from zero to 57 and basically check all the numbers within that range saying whether the numbers are prime or not Okay, so we just took a look at the example of a prime number Let's try to take a look at another example where we want to reverse all elements in the list one And this is another very common and basic interview questions that you will be asked during your tech interviews And Python really have multiple ways of doing this type of operations The most obvious way is to use the list indexing and slicing that we've talked about so what I can do here is I can just do print list one and square bracket to use the indexing and then I can do a colon colon minus one. So what I did here is that I didn't specify the start or the stop position, meaning I want to retrieve all the elements in the list one, but I define the stride to be minus one. So that means that I want to actually start from backward from the right side to the left side. So it's going to start from the element D and to the element A. So if I run this, then you risk the complete reverse of what we have in the list one. So this is one very obvious way of doing it. But usually when you go to the interview, they want you to create a loop to handle this rather than writing a one liner like this, because they want to see how you approach this type of problem using the iteration. Uh, so then let's try to create a loop here. But before we do that, let's talk about the strategy here. What would be the easiest way for us to handle this type of problem? I'm sure there can be many ways but the most simple and effective approach should be to start iterating this list from the end meaning the from element D to element A and we can just create a new list to actually completely reverse a string like what we see here so then let's create a for loop with that in mind so I can do for i in range and then for the stop index I'm gonna say len list 1 and do a negative 1 here and then stop index should be negative 1 and stretch should be negative 1 so let me quickly walk through what I did here. As the start position, I specify the land list one negative one. So the land list one should be four. 
and if I do minus one on that, it should be three, right? So if you look at the indexing on the list one, the A is zero, one, two, three. So this means that I want to actually start this iteration from this index, meaning the element D, and in the stop index, I specify the negative one. And the reason why I did that is because stop index is exclusive and I want to stop at the index of zero, which has the element of A. So this range function will take this negative one. And since this is gonna be exclusive, it's gonna actually stop at the index of zero. And I also put negative one as the stride because we want to actually move from right to left, meaning I want to actually decrement the index every time for each iteration that's happening. So in the initial iteration, the land list one negative one should be three. And in the next iteration, this negative one stride will actually subtract minus one from that. So it's gonna be uh, index of two, index of one, until index of zero, which we specified right here. So in here, all I need to do is just print list one and use the indexing square bracket i. And if I just print this, then you will see the DCBA printed out line by line. So in this case, if you want to actually print out the result like this, all we have to do is just to create a new list and then just append this result into the new list and print a new list out. So new list dot append, parenthesis here. And at the end of the for loop, I can just print new list. And if I print this one more time, then you will see the two exactly identical results coming out. One coming from this print statement and the other one coming from this new list here. Okay, so we just implemented our for loop that actually reversed the list one. Let me show you one other variation of this, which is very similar. So let me just copy and paste this. Control C and Control V down here. And the logic here is that instead of having the this kind of logic inside the range function, we want to put somewhat similar logic into this uh, list indexing into the square bracket that we have here. So let me just delete all this negative ones here and just put the land list one right here. And inside this uh, square bracket, what I can do here is just, uh, land list one, meaning we want to actually start from here but we want to do negative i and negative one. So let me quickly walk through this real quick. So for i in range land list one, so the land list one is uh, specified as a stop index. So this i in the first iteration will be zero and it's gonna stop at the index of three because the stop index is exclusive. And if you look at the new list that append list one, this square bracket, we are actually specifying the land list one here. So that means that it's gonna be four here but we are doing the minus i. So in the first iteration, the land list one will be four minus zero, so it's still four, and then we are doing minus one. Uh, so in the first iteration, the list one square bracket will be three, meaning the end of the index that we have in the list one here, which is d. And in the second iteration, the i will be one. So the land list one is four, minus one is three, minus one is two, so then the, in the second iteration, the list one square bracket two, which is the element C here, which is the second to the last element. And in the third iteration, it's gonna hit B. And in the last iteration, it's gonna hit A. So in the last iteration, the I will be three. So the land list one is four, minus three is one, minus one is zero. So we are basically saying list one square bracket zero, which is the last element, the element A here. So if I run this, then you will see the same result as well coming out from this method. Okay guys, that's it for this video. We've taken a look at some of the basic examples of how we can use the for loop to perform different type of operations. And obviously we are only covering really base level examples as there are numerous scenarios where we can utilize the for loop in many different shapes and forms. And I'll try to include them one by one as we progress forward with other Python topics. And from our next video, we'll get into while loops, which is another method of Python iteration. So please stay tuned. And if you haven't subscribed already, please click the subscribe and like button. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you in next videos.